if one accepts the contention that thoughts are causative, then with that acceptance in mind, if, if, if the seeker is persuaded of that idea, then is the wish alone enough? Wait a minute, did I just hear Mitch Horowitz say that we can manifest good into our lives without having to feel happy, happy, happy? That's exactly what he says in his new book, Daydream Believer, Unlocking the Ultimate Power of Your Mind. In this video, Mitch talks about how you can manifest the life of your dreams even if you're feeling down or depressed. And he also talks about why he believes that it's important to be honest with his readers about his own experiments and struggles. Okay, so uh, to begin with, uh, one of the things that um, I really love about Daydream Believer is that you flip the script on a lot of new thought orthodoxy. And for instance, where we're taught to feel what it's like to be sitting in a sparse car, if that's what we're seeking, to be happy, to really have that felt sense of having that um, intention answered. Uh, but you say no, that we can manifest even if we're depressed, even if we're anxious. And, and talk a little bit about how that's possible. Well, that, that's certainly my, my effort. I mean, that's my current line of experimentation. Um, one of the frustrations I've had with New Thought Methods in my own practice, and I'm sure uh, uh, many of your listeners can relate to this personally, is that at those moments when I feel despair or anxiety or grief or what have you, that's precisely when I, I need that royal key that is going to help me unlock whatever mechanism it is that we use through the mind to enact creative or causative energies. And yet, we're frequently told in New Thought that the secret is the feeling state. Feeling is the secret is the title of one of the books by my intellectual hero, Neville Goddard. And I honor the legitimacy of that method, but I push back against its limitations because I think for many of us, and certainly this is true for me, and I can't imagine my life or practice is, is, is exceptional in some way, I think for many of us, when we are faced with grief, anxiety, depression, you name it, we are unable to alter our feeling state. Certainly from um, the comfort of an armchair with a full belly, uh, with the Wi-Fi working, with everything going just fine, uh, we're apt to say, well, of course I can change my feeling state. The directions are simple. But when actually confronted at 4 a.m. with, with one's waking nightmares, it's, it's, it's extremely hard. And I've asked myself, has Mother Nature just played some cruel joke on us? When we're most deeply in need, is that when we are divorced from the key method, this thinking from the end, living from the end, feeling from the end, this key method? And so I asked myself, is it possible if a person accepts, as I do, that the mind has causative abilities, and I, I, I make an, an effort to argue for that as persuasively as I'm able in Daydream Believer, and I draw upon psychology and the hard sciences and the experience of seekers, among other things. If one accepts the contention that thoughts are causative, then with that acceptance in mind, if, if, if the seeker is persuaded of that idea, then is the wish alone enough? Can we dispense with some of the familiar techniques, liturgy, ways and means of being? Not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with those techniques, but are they necessary and are they there for us when we're in our deepest hour of need? That's what I'm working with. Yeah, I think that's a tremendously, tremendously exciting area. And, and I know earlier you had also spoken in some interviews about the idea that uh, that even even the belief in the causative powers of the mind in and of itself may be enough in those circumstances as well. Yeah, yeah. I was inspired in that regard by a study that was conducted by the program in 
the placebo response at Harvard University Medical School, a program that's a very innovative program that's run by a man named Ted Kapchuk, and he has some extraordinary uh, collaborators. And they um, enacted a study, uh, and it was replicated in Portugal uh, some years ago, where um, I think it must have been, uh, maybe it was two, mm, 2010, it's been a few years now, but it was, re it was reenacted in Portugal, where it was called the Transparent Placebo Study. And <clears throat> in the pl Transparent Placebo Study, uh, sufferers uh, here in the American version of the study, sufferers of irritable bowel syndrome were told that they were being given an inert substance. And about 59% um, of sufferers reported lasting and sustained belief, as opposed to about 35% in the control group, which is statistically very significant. And then researchers in Portugal repeated that study with sufferers of lower back pain. Again, same deal, yet a control group that was just given zero treatment, and then you had a study group that was given an inert substance and told transparently this is an inert substance and they had results that were statistically very similar and some other very hopeful things including increased mobility, increased flexibility and so forth. And I got to asking myself, you know, how can we extrapolate from these findings? And we now have two studies, uh, widely interpreted, widely uh, read, published, talked about, reported upon, juried, and we have what seems to be a gold standard of evidence that the placebo effect, whatever it is, I mean, there's still a mystery there, can be enacted through, I guess I would have to say, through belief in the agency of a placebo response at all. You know, if the individual enters a study and he or she believes in the efficacy of what we call the placebo response, and I would say the overwhelming majority of people walking around in the Western world today have heard of, acknowledged, commonly believe in, yes, I get it, I, I understand that, it's a widely accepted concept. And then they're told, well, we're going to test this concept without the deception, without giving you the sham pill. And we're going to see if it works. And we have two studies demonstrating that, yes, it works. Now, the, the, what, again, what the placebo response is it can be a dozen different things, none of them mutually exclusive. It could be what the prayer response looks like in the body. It could be what hopeful expectancy looks like in the body. It also seems to be maybe a release of endorphins or anti-inflammatory enzymes or something. But there's no reason to think that it's any one thing. It could be do dozens of things. But whatever it is, it works based on the individual's expectancy. So could that be extrapolated to mind metaphysics broadly defined? So that was one of the things that uh, inspired this part of my search. Oh, that, that's awesome. And I find it particularly hopeful, too, because uh, um, as with you, you know, I've, I've had um, ongoing anxiety issues throughout my life. So. I mean, that, that we don't have to um, jack ourselves up into, you know, some sort of, of feeling state that we can't access. And yeah. one of the interesting things that you remarked as well is that uh, there's really almost separate tracks for thought, uh, for emotions, and uh, for the body and, and physicality. So, uh, you know, the, the presumption uh, at least in some new th thought orthodoxy, is that thought should rule, but you're arguing that that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, I, I find myself nowadays speaking in terms of the psyche. I see the psyche as a compact of thought and emotion. Uh, so for me, the psyche is emotionalized thought, you know, and, and the psyche, of course, has a physical element as well. Uh, we feel emotionalized thought. We feel it in our necks. We feel it in our backs. We feel it in our gut. Uh, everybody has an experience they can describe of where they feel emotionalized thoughts. So I speak in terms of the psyche nowadays. And you know, that also brings to mind that, that you really write with refreshing candor about your life, about your metaphysical experiments, both successes and failures. And what inspires you to be this open with readers? Because it, it is unusual within self-help literature. Yes. Well, you know, several years ago, 
I was interviewing different authors within the New Age genre. And frankly, I don't think I'm a very good interviewer. <laughs> I don't think it's my forte. But I made an effort. And um, in a couple of instances, uh, one in particular, I was talking to people who I knew uh, suffered from emotional torments in their lives. In some cases, I might have known people professionally. In some cases, I might have known people privately. And yet, as soon as the camera was on, as soon as the microphone was on, they would hold forth with these 15-minute responses as if you know every word was anointed them by heaven's angels just singing and speaking of how you can lead the good life, how you can lead the beautiful life. And I wasn't, maybe I would handle it differently today, but I wasn't suitably uh, assertive as an interviewer, which I wish I had been, although <laughs> had I been, I would no longer have relationships with these people. But, but it, 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 as it happens, that's the case anyway. Um, I wasn't suitably assertive at the time as an interviewer to say, hey, I know for a fact that when a book of yours doesn't land on a bestseller list, you fly into a rage because I've either been in the room where this has happened or, you know, I'm on the phone or something like that. And I thought, how much more hot, how much more live, how much more relevant, how much more meaningful a conversation it would be if a, a person who is a household name or a near household name as a best-selling New Age author would acknowledge in front of a microphone on camera uh, the depths of his or her own despair or rage or addiction or problems or whatever it is and we all have them and and then we could say okay so without throwing out all of these methods without discounting all of these methods let's ask what's not working and why and perhaps we can extrapolate from that a problem that's general to human nature and begin to start looking for some different possibilities right here and now in this generation. So I came to feel that uh, uh, unless, you know, I, I, was, I was being morbidly self-disclosing in some way that was unnecessary, anywhere where it was necessary I would make the effort to be uh, self-disclosing to the reader. Because I, I, I feel that's the only way we can conduct a real exchange. You know, just imagine how incredible it would be if a widely read New Age or self-help author would acknowledge, not again in some exploitative way, but just in a matter-of-fact way, his or her own problems, and then think how much less alone the listener would feel, and more importantly than, than, than that, uh, we could start to get down to brass tacks and say, look, is this possible? Is it, is it not possible? Are we looking for the key in the wrong place? Or maybe there's a different kind of key? And so I really wanted to make a commitment um, to being transparent. This was the first of a series of interviews with author Mitch Horowitz about his book, Daydream Believer, Unlocking the Ultimate Power of Your Mind. In future interviews, we'll be talking about Mitch's theory about why thoughts are causative and how that theory can also explain topics like ESP and UFOs. Mitch and I also talk about the limits to the law of attraction or manifestation and why new thought remains relevant today. Make sure to like this video and hit subscribe to see future videos with Mitch and other guests. Also make sure to visit my website and blog harfbishop.com. Links to harfbishop.com and Mitch's new book, Daydream Believer, are in the comments section below.